Well, a warm welcome to this talk. It's Thursday the 30th of March now. I just wanted to record a, a very brief video today because I've been looking at the Zoe COVID symptom tracker information from the Zoe Health study that shows that the symptoms from uh, COVID, coronavirus infection, are becoming more and more common cold-like. But then I noticed from the Office for National Statistics that excess deaths for the latest week that we have data from for the United Kingdom are still 9.3% above the five-year average. And there's a bit of a mismatch here. What it means is we're looking for something else for the cause of excess deaths or other causes, one or one cause or, or, or probably almost certainly many causes. That's what this video is about. Let's just unpack some of the detail on that now. Now, this is the, uh, the COVID symptom tracker data here. So we see sore throat, of people that are diagnosed positively with COVID, that would have a positive test, 59% have a sore throat, runny nose, 54%, block nose, 52%, headache, 51%, sneezing, 50%. These are the most common features. It's becoming more and more common cold-like as time goes on, as this is becoming more and more an upper respiratory infection, not causing the lower severe problems of the pneumonia, anything like as much as we saw before. And in fact, now um, intensive care, my colleagues in intensive care aren't really seeing any COVID pneumonias now. They're more seeing uh, exac exacerbations of existing conditions, particularly, of course, in the elderly. And sadly, in people that are obese, particularly as well. But we, we, we notice these are very much common cold symptoms. This is the main thing that really struck me that from this data, it kind of jumped out at me that these are very common cold type symptoms. Cough with no phlegm. Again, we can all relate to this so many times. I mean, I, I get, I seem to get a bad cold about every, I don't know, every no, three, four times a year. <laughs> it seems, seems more, but I guess it's maybe three times a year I get a fairly decent cold. And uh, we're all so familiar with these um so familiar with these symptoms. But these, of course, are COVID symptoms now uh, in, uh, in March 2023. Uh, cough, sometimes with a phlegm, productive cough. No phlegm would be an unproductive cough. Of course, unproductive coughs can become productive uh, over time. Hoarse voice, muscle aches and pains, tiredness, altered smell, now, the altered smell, of course, uh, or the lost smell is, is, a, is a general common cold symptom. The altered smell is still more of a COVID type symptom. So it is there. There is still some differentiation. But again, it's becoming more and more upper respiratory common cold type features. Um, altered smell, dizzy, lightheaded, 19%. Swollen neck glands, 17%. Sore eyes, of course, very common cold feature. Very common cold, chest pain, tightness down to 14%, thankfully now. Shortness of breath down to 13%, shiver or chills indicating a bit of a fever, 13%, and actual fever recorded 11%. So very much common cold type symptoms, and yet it's really quite distressing that the excess deaths continue and um, um, like, 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 like me, um, you may have lost friends or relatives lately, um, sometimes at a young age. These are real human beings that we're, we are talking about. But let's look at the data from the Office of National Statistics. Now, of course, this data is not perfect, but it's, it's probably the best we've got at the moment. Um, this is up to the week ending the 17th of March, always a bit of a delay with deaths, of course. Estimated number of people testing positive, first of all, in the UK, nearly one and a half million, 2.66% of the population, around one in 40 people are actually testing positive. So th this is actually showing that we have a huge amount of positivity, 2.6% of the whole population. We must all be getting COVID. I would have thought, certainly being exposed to COVID several times a year on average, um, testing positive, if we tested everyone perhaps once once or twice a year, that kind of order. It's very endemic now. This is everywhere uh, a lot of the time um, and will be, will be so for, for the coming uh, decade or two probably. We are in periods of endemicity. One in 40 people, remember this is only data for one week. So this is a lot of people for one week. 
And here we see the numbers in England as an example. I mean, they're going, well, they're sort of flattish at the moment, aren't they? They go up and down a bit. But again, for the most part, thankfully, not overly perturbing because for most people, it's a mild common cold type illness. But um, week ending the 17th of March, 2023, 12,133 deaths in the UK. Okay, people die. 559 mentioned COVID, COVID uh, coronavirus, um, COVID-19. 4.6% of deaths mentioned it. Um, what, what the Office of National Statistics are actually saying is that 67.3% of these deaths, 379 deaths, uh, had this recorded as the underlying cause of death. But as we've already said, most of these, of course, were in the elderly. Uh, or people with sometimes significant comorbidities, but mostly the vast majority in the elderly, which of course is it is incredibly sad if people are dying um, earlier than they would have done already. But these are mostly people with elderly people and pre-existing conditions. And of course, as we age, we get more and more conditions. This is sometimes unflatteringly called senile multiple pathology, because old people can often have many different uh, conditions all at once as, a, as these conditions sort of accumulate through life. Um, so the number of deaths above the five-year average in private homes, uh, 23% above the average. In hospitals, 4.6. Incredible, 23.2% above the five-year average. I mean, you could say this is good, but people and more people are dying at home, but there's still an awful lot of increased deaths at the same time. In hospitals, 4.6%. Care homes, 4.7% above the five-year average. Other settings, prisons and other institutional settings, 6.9% above the average. Deaths registered in the UK uh, in the week ending the 17th of March, 13,683. This is for the UK as a whole, 9.3% above the five-year average. So this is still a lot of... This is... A significant increase, on, as we'll see in a minute, on top of what's happening in other countries, on top of um, what's happened over the past um, many, many months now. 1,169 uh, 1, more deaths than the five-year average. Now, the, the way this is measured by the Office of National Statistics has changed recently. Uh, this website says it's 2016 to 19, so that's 16, 17, 18, 19, plus 20, 21. Um, others document, other sources are taking 2022 into account. But of course, in early 2021, there was a very high amount of excess deaths. So this this is actually, because there are so many excess deaths in 2021, we'd expect even fewer deaths at the moment, and we're getting more. This is the point that, uh, again, is particularly concerning. Now, we're going to look at the quick look at the graphics that we've been, uh, we've been showing on this. So the green is deaths not involving COVID-19. The blue is deaths involving COVID-19. And this is the graph we looked at for some time here. So we see the excess deaths involving COVID-19, and I will be blowing up on this in a minute. But what we notice here is uh, the five-year average for weeks one to eight in 2022 and 2023 are affected by this very high number in early 2021. So rightly, we would expect this to be lower, but we'd expect this to be lower as well, but it's higher. Let's just zoom in on that for a bit of uh, clarity there. So it's not surprising that these deaths here are lower than the five-year average because of the 2021 increase. But here we're still seeing excess deaths. And but remember, this is despite the increase in the average in 20, early 2021, which was uh, a significant number. Uh, as, um, as we actually saw, let's just check on that just to remind ourselves here, uh, this very high peak here. Uh, should have greatly altered these averages. But um, as we still see, they're what we would expect. They're not what we would expect. Um, so we'd expect deaths to be even lower at the moment. Tragically, they are not. And if we actually look at the last few months here, so th th these are weekly figures, so that's ending the 17th of March. And we see there's green and blue uh, 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 all the way all the way through the, the, these many, many months. Now, uh, and remember that these blue ones, the COVID-19 associated deaths, by no means all of those died from COVID-19. Many of those died with COVID-19, not from COVID-19. So this is what struck me. It's the mismatch between the common cold symptoms and the amount of people dying. And this really does cry out for an explanation. Questions have been asked in Parliament, of course. 
uh, with no satisfactory answers. So I just want to very briefly, last minute, just summarise some of my thinking here. This is probably multifactorial, almost certainly multifactorial. Um, excess deaths have occurred around the world. So the problem is, if this was just in the UK, but it's not, this is in the UK, it's in the States, in Canada, it's in Australia, it's certainly all around European Union countries, very, very high excess deaths all around the European Union countries. What is it that these countries have got in common that could explain this? This is just not being adequately interrogated, in my view. We have to look for these factors. You know, if people are dying of lung cancer, is it because more people are smoking? You know, there's often, a, we have a cause and effect thing going on here. And this is what we need to analyse. It's no good just saying, well, these are correlations. We have to look for the cause and effect. And that's exactly what happened with lung cancer. We found, well, not, not we, some brilliant scientists, Austin Bradford Hill and, uh, Austin Bradford Hill and Sir Richard Dole, realised the uh, correlation. And then other scientists in laboratory work proved that tar and other carcinogens in cigarettes were actually pathologically the cause. So the correlation comes first, but the work needs to be done to find out what the causative etiology is. And um, it just doesn't seem to be, unfortunately, at the moment. Which is, it's, it's really hard to uh, explain this absence of uh, research. Why aren't the governments around the world sponsoring research on this? Well, why isn't there an organised, concerted international effort? You know, we said yesterday, wouldn't it be good if we had an international organisation which was responsible for looking after world health? that would be analysing this data. That would be ideal, wouldn't it? You know, what, what, what is, uh, what, why is this not being adequately studied? This is such a serious matter. So excess, probably multifactorial, but deaths have, have occurred around the world. Let's look for a common, um, or, or group of, a common cause or group of causes uh, uh, that, that would explain the, the tragedy. And tragedy is the only word I can think of. It may transpire there is a common factor or factors so um gi gi given given that um arguably uh, the current uh, organizations set up in the world to analyze world health in my view are not analyzing this adequately um then we need to work out an alternative way to do it governments around the world could cooperate they could send liaison officers around the world they could soon coordinate this and do this and uh, maybe the funding that is attributed to some organizations that aren't performing perhaps as well as we would like could be awarded to uh, to this project but we need the data and we need it yesterday the day before last year uh, this how long is this going to go on so there you go uh, 9.3% deaths above the five-year average in the UK uh, and, and similar in, in other countries. And uh, we're just not getting answers. But like me, maybe you've suffered bereavements. Um, we do need this answered. Th thank you for watching. <laughs>